I am usually the benediction at these events and often ask the question, so what? Uh, it's great to get together and to discuss eschatology. I certainly have appreciated today's presentations and those that have gone on before. I especially appreciated Captain Young who um, incarnationally is living out the very things that I want to talk to you about today. But as I sat and reflected on the things that I want to share with you, the question came into my mind also, uh, have you ever thought about what the world would be like if it were not for the church? Have you ever thought about what your life would be like if it were not for the church? Uh, have you ever been in the presence of what you felt was just absolute evil? And as you have that thought in mind, what do you think it would be like? if there was not the check of the Holy Spirit and the people of God. And another question I've been asking myself, we hear a lot today about what is your carbon footprint, right? And, and I'm thinking as we think about going into the world and what this all means is what kind of footprint are we leaving personally? And as a church, as a seminary, uh, we're looking at going to Pennsylvania and have been looking at a campus back there, as many of you know, and as I've talked with the leaders of that community, I've been able to with confidence say, if Weinbrenner Seminary comes to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, there will be a difference in the life of this community. Francis Schaeffer, a number of years ago, asked a question in the title of a book. How shall we then live? And that's really one I want to share with you. I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to share just a couple of reflections from Scripture with you and some quotes from Wright. I had the privilege recently of, of going to Scotland to see my kids and grandkids and you'll see more of that later and Ruth I really appreciate where's Ruth the Ruth here is still dipping ice cream she she did this in all green and when you go to Scotland everything is green and there's a reason that everything is green it never stops raining we were in Ireland some time ago and I was at the rental car place turning the rental car back in and I said is there ever a day in Ireland that it doesn't rain, which has similar weather to Scotland? And he says, oh, we have a special philosophy here at this rental car place. If there's a day that you have one of our cars and it doesn't rain, we'll give you your money back. <laughs> and we've never had to pay. <laughs> but I do appreciate the green. How shall we then live? On this trip, I finished reading Wright's book and then also visited Iona, which I'll talk about in a little while, and picked up the biography of St. Columba. And I'm going to use his life as a case study from many years ago because I believe it is so applicable to what we're talking about today. But as I read Wright, there was one place that he quoted Ephesians 5.14, Awake sleeper, rise from the dead, and the Messiah will give you light. And as he, as he expanded on that and talked about it, he said, wake up. It's time for the church to wake up. Come alive to the real world where Jesus is Lord. And I quote, what we all need from time to time is for someone, a friend, 
a spiritual director, a stranger, a sermon, a verse of scripture, or simply the inner prompting of the Spirit to say it is time to wake up. You've been asleep long enough. The sun is shining. And there's a wonderful day out there. Wake up and get a life. The message of Easter then is neither that God once did a spectacular miracle but then decided not to do many others, nor that there is a blissful life after death to look forward to. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you're now invited to belong to it. Wake up, church. The kingdom of God is here. Now, Wright goes on. He talks about the fact that to enter this new world, we need to celebrate Easter in a different way. He said, I'm tired of it being just one day a year. Where we, we, we hype it up and, and then we pretend like that's it. Folks, this is it. This is all of it. There's nothing else. There is no plan B. Let the church be the church and let the kingdom come now. And let us have the privilege of participating in that kingdom coming. I'm going to give you a list of scriptures and these are the summaries of the passages that uh, I want to share with you. And I want to make this an interactive time. You've been listening to people stand up here and one-on-one -on -one you most of the day and then going off in small groups. So there are times that I'm going to stop and just ask you to reflect with me on what I've already said. I'm actually going to stop in the middle and give you a chance of small groups to interact with the first question on the list. But let's just stop for a moment before I go into the scripture passages. How do you react to the fact that it's time to wake up? What's your footprint? Talk with me. Quickly. I only have so much time. Actually, I'm president, so... <laughs> And he, how much of my time did he take? <laughs> right? You're right, Mr. Universe. <laughs> yeah, don't mess with me. There have been a few things that have sagged, but don't mess with me. What was that? That was the question. That was the question. <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> How do you react to the fact that we neither are celebrating something that happened and he doesn't do anything now, or we're just waiting? We're just hanging on until we can get to the other side. I don't know about you, but for me, that's not the way I want to live life. I have no desire to wait and watch while people are lost and wandering and God's creation is groaning and I'm groaning. I don't want to just wait. What about you? What kind of footprint do you want to leave? Where are you making a difference? in the kingdom. I think it makes me realize I don't have much of a footprint right now. It makes me want to make one. You know, Good. It's, you know, I don't want it to all go to waste. So one of the things this summit can do is to motivate us to go out and do something. Yes? I want my footprint to be outside of church. Right where, right where I am. In the world? In the world. In the world. Mm -hmm. Others? Quickly. I don't want my footprint to be the size 12 of Sheldon Ames. I want it to be the sandwich of the feet of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
That's profound. That's profound. Wright makes a lot of the fact that at the end of Romans chapter 8, what was that? <laughs> Let me read to you Romans 8, 18 to 25. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who His children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Just a little aside there, we did this study with our university kids in this room on Tuesday evening and I was able to confess to them that I didn't understand the groans of childbirth other than to hear them. I didn't understand the reality. And we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as His adopted children. Including the new bodies He has promised us. Maybe I'll get a Dave Draper body. <laughs> we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it, but we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. There's a song that the church sings that I do not like. It's hold the forts for I am coming. Jesus whispers still. You know why I don't like it? I don't think the church is supposed to be holding the fort. I think the kingdom of the evil one, the gates of hell ought to be rattling as a result of the power of the resurrection in the life of the church. And we ought to be moving confidently into ministry, not on our heels. Amen. The Lord's prayer has become significant in my life. There are times when I can't sleep that I pray it over and over and over again that I'll stop and I'll, I'll rephrase every phrase in my own words. And there's a part of it that, that lives and breathes. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's taken on special meaning as I wait patiently and confidently for His return. And I think our authors have, they've convinced me. I was convinced long before I read them. That I'm a participant in the bringing of the kingdom of God. Because I'm a child of the king. Adopted into the family of God. Join heirs with Jesus Christ. With authority granted by him. Not my authority. His authority. And then the third one, how did we get to there? You got kind of exuberant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know your own strength. <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians 2 says we are God's masterpiece in the New Living Translation. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Or the NIV, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us. And what I do is I try to picture this verse in my mind. I am God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. And as I've reflected on this, I've thought about the fact that God's working from a piece of art 
that looks exactly like what I was created to be. Isn't that phenomenal? Through Jesus Christ, He sees me as the masterpiece He created me to be, and you also. And His church. Now, we're not there yet, are we? But as I live life as a kingdom person, I'm watching as the brush strokes continue to, to appear before me as I look in the mirror and as I examine my life in light of Him, I'm looking more like Him through the power of the Holy Spirit, sanctifying my life and setting me apart, setting you apart, creating you, recreating you in what you were meant to be. What's it like to live in this world? It's to live as God's masterpieces. I, I, I get frustrated sometimes with the evangelical church. It's my church. It's, it's, where I, it's my tribe. It's where I belong. But there's been so much focus on telling us how bad we are that we forgot. Or we have forgot. That we're God's masterpieces created a little lower than the angels in His image. And then Wright makes a lot of 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. And I really like when he comes to the end and, and he quotes the passage, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know, and this is the part that he loves, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The New Living Translation says it's never useless. And what that means is, is that God's redeeming this stuff out here. You know that. He, we got messed up in our interpretation of the Word of God. Uh, the book on heaven by Randy Alcorn really helped me a number of years ago in this issue. They said, it's not a new heavens and a new earth. God's not in the business now of creating new. He's in the business of redeeming what He already created. And we participate with Him in that redemption. What a privilege. And then there's a troubling verse. The, wor the Word of God is troubling to me sometimes. And the troubling passage is from John 14. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. Does that trouble any of you? I remember, you know the name John Wimber? Third wave of the Spirit, taught it for years at Fuller, got converted, someone handed him the Gospel of John and told him, Pastor told him to go home and read the Gospel of John. He came back the next week and he said, when do we get to do the stuff? And the pastor said, what do you mean, when do we get to do the stuff? And he said, well, Jesus did a lot of stuff. Now, this is a newly converted Christian. Jesus got to do a lot of stuff. And it says in there, we get to do not only the, the same stuff, we even get to do more. What in the world does that mean? <coughs> One commentator says that it's not about that we do greater works than he does, but we have a greater sphere of influence. Just think about that in terms of today's age and technology and everything that's going on. Do we have a greater sphere of influence than Jesus had? Oh, my. What responsibility with that greater sphere of influence? The world should be a different and a better place as a result of our presence carrying on the work of the kingdom. Bringing his kingdom here helping to recreate the masterpiece that he originally meant it to be. And then there's a passage in the last chapter of John about Peter's reinstatement. I'm not going to go into the love issues. I simply want to go into the vocational issues. 
before this, the first call for Peter was a call to be what? What was his first call? Fishers of men. Correct? Now, Peter knew a lot about fishing, right? Uh, Jesus taught him a few things about fishing. Remember, he had been fishing all night and um, hadn't caught anything. And Jesus said, well, let's go fishing. And Peter said, oh, <laughs> Lord, you know a lot about this other stuff, but I know a lot about fishing. <laughs> Well, they went fishing and they caught fish. So I imagine Jesus saying to him, Peter, I want you to be a fisher of men. He knew a lot about fishing and so he could make the mental jump to being a fisher of men. But in this call, things change. In the 21st chapter of John, he's not calling him to be a fisherman. What's he calling him to be? A shepherd. Now, Peter didn't know a lot about being a shepherd, and probably what he did know about being a shepherd, he didn't like. Could have been part of his response in struggling with answering Jesus appropriately. And as I reflect on that, I went to school to be a school teacher. And I was raised on a farm. I know something about farming and I know something about teaching school. Eighth grade math and science. But one day God called me to be a disciple maker. And I'm still learning about how to be a disciple maker. And we've spent a lot of time in this seminary talking to you about not only being a disciple maker, but making disciples who make disciples. That's what's going to change the world. That's what's going to make the kingdom come and his will be done as we invest ourselves in people. But people business is messy business, right? I so much appreciated Captain Young coming. Because it's one thing for us to stand in the pulpit and talk about what it means to live out our lives in this world. It's another thing to practically do it day by day in a world that's anti who he is. And so, quite frankly, I really appreciate you when you said we need to smell like the sheep. It's time for us, all of us, to get out of our comfort zones whatever God originally called us to and to go out into the world as has already been said and live out our lives. Now at this point I'd like to stop and just give you five minutes to deal with question number one as small groups on my handout. Scotland um, where now it is 9.15 and time to turn in. Um, but not for you. Now, the primary purpose of the trip was to visit my son, daughter-in-law, Andrews. They're doing four months residency for a uh, Ph.D. in practical theology at the University of Aberdeen. But really, they probably weren't the primary purpose. Here's one of the primary purposes. <laughs> That's the older of my two grandsons, Aiden. Um, uh, Aiden's an interesting, he's part of my footprint. He's part of our footprint. And three years ago, we were away on vacation together, and he said to me, I said to him, Andrew, do you know how much Pap, or Aiden, do you know how much Pap loves you? Yeah, Pap. I said, and, and do you know how much God loves you, Aiden? He said, oh, yes, Pap, I know how much he loves me, and I love him so much. And I pray to him. I, I pray, uh, I especially pray for, there's, in the community where they live, there's a, little, there's a sign that says, hearing impaired child. He says, I, I pray for that little boy. 
He said, I, I, I like to pray for people to be healed. He says, matter of fact, Pap, let's go on a healing journey. He said, you be Jesus and I'll be Peter. <laughs> Linda says, don't come home trying that. <laughs> So we circled the table in the screened-in porch, and he'd stop, and there'd be a teddy bear or a doll or something there from the folks that lived in this cabin, owned the cabin. And he'd tell me what kind of sickness they had and say, now pray for them and heal them, Jesus. <coughs> That's kingdom stuff, folks. That's not... That, 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 that's from the Lord working in this little guy. That's Aiden. This is Alistair playing his bag. Oh no, didn't work. There he is. Now this is my son in the flesh. Uh, he's a charmer. Uh, he has the philosophy in life that if you discipline him, he looks up at you and smiles and in his mind is basically saying, Pap, that's really not for me, that's for other people. I'm special. <laughs> I am Prince Charming. <laughs> but I can remember when my daughter-in-law posted on Facebook that she could no longer cut Bible studies short because at age four he started to read and he was reading them on his own and, and she couldn't eliminate the parts that she didn't want to speak because Alistair was going to read them on his own now. And here they are as the tigers that they were meant to be. Kingdom forces. So that was the primary purpose, to see my grandsons. <laughs> but we also decided that we wanted to visit on the back, Iona. Iona is an island that's about three miles long and a mile wide. Um, and you might say, well, why in the world did you want to visit Iona? As a matter of fact, to get to Iona, Linda and I went there one day ourselves and spent about three hours, and then Andrew and Leslie said they would like to go too, so we went back for another trip, and on this trip we went one day and stayed overnight in a hostel in uh, bedroom, three bunk beds, all six of us together. That was an experience. <laughs> Wonderful experience. But to get to Iona, you leave the mainland, you take a ferry that takes about 50 minutes to get to the island of Mall, and on the island of Mall, you travel on a one-lane road. Uh, that one-lane road, um, they, the bus driver said uh, they tried to convince the British that they didn't, they only need to pay half the taxes because they only had half the road. He said, so we don't drive on the left side of the road here, we drive on what's left. <laughs> but we traveled by bus across the island of Mall for about an hour and 15 minutes to, in order to take another ferry for 10 to 15 minutes to get to this little island of Iona. And you'd say, why in the world would you want to go there? Well, Iona is probably the birthplace of Christianity in Scotland. Um, Columba, Saint Columba, not Columbo, John. Not Columbus. Columba was uh, born in Ireland, uh, destined to be a king of one of the tribes in that, on that island. Uh, but became a priest and did something wrong. We, there, there are two different stories as to about what he did wrong. Uh, one is, is that he loved to copy the Psalms and he had taken one of the official copies of the Psalms so, home so that he could copy the Psalms and the church wanted it back and not only did they want it back but they wanted his copy of it back and he refused to give it back and so they disciplined him and the discipline was a pilgrimage and to do penance on Iona. The other story is that being a um, destined to be a king that he got involved in a battle between two kings at the time 
and was actually injured in the battle and that wasn't appropriate for a priest and some said he even carried a scar to his grave from that injury in the battle. We don't know for sure, but for some reason he was exiled or had to go away to Iona. This was quite a man. I got a biography of him by a professor at Aberdeen University, Ian Bradley, and read that also along with N.T. Wright's book and quite a contrast between what Wright is saying is necessary for the kingdom today there and yet a lot of things similar as to what Columba would have said was necessary for the kingdom of God there. Let's talk about uh, the routine that he carried on when he got to the island of Iona. It was really things that he had been doing prior to this, but these are the things that I think are the kinds of things that are necessary for us if we're going to leave a footprint for the kingdom in the world. He was a great prayer warrior. He loved to copy the Psalms. As a matter of fact, um, we're, uh, history says that there was an aura about this man that when he was in his little one-room cell that had cracks in the wood, that there was light, that even if he didn't have light burning, there was light shining out, that he was such a personality at that point. He copied the Psalms and memorized all 150 Psalms. And many nights he would get up in the middle of the night and he would recite 350s. That's what he called it. He would recite all 150 Psalms. We would go down along the beach. And it provided something like an amphitheater, and they say his voice could be heard a mile away. As he lamented with the Psalms of Lament. As he praised God and worshipped. But he would recite the 350s along the beach in the middle of the night. Uh, he offered all kinds of pastoral care and spiritual leadership in the community. We'll talk a little bit about the spiritual leadership. He obviously founded and ran many uh, monastic communities. He played a high profile role in various disputes and actually believed that he had the authority to anoint kings. That God would say to him, as he did to Samuel, go anoint this person king and he would go anoint them. And... Um, person would become king. And so he used the influence that he had, his footprint as to who he was in the kingdom, who he was born, and he used that to leverage all kinds of things in his day and age. So he was quite involved in the secular world. Uh, well beyond any comprehension that, that we might have. There was no separation of church and state in the mind of St. Columba. Deeply involved. Any questions before I go on? Because I'm going, to, I'm going to push buttons even further as we go along because I am convinced one of the things I want to read you from the back of this book. Uh, there's a community there now. This is, it, it's, they're still there. And there's publication, Wild Goose Publications. And Wild Goose Publications publish materials, books, tape, CDs on... Holistic spirituality, social justice, political and peace issues, healing, innovative approaches to worship, songs in worship, including the work of all the Wild Goose Resource Group, material for meditation and reflection. And as I think about what Columba did, he came to this island in 563 A.D. And the cross that I had up here a few moments ago... Um, that is St. John's Cross. They're in the process of trying to restore, and you can see the parts that they have that they've already restored, and that's from somewhere around 800 A.D., not maybe 100, 150 years after he was there. The community is all over the world now, uh, 15 or 1,600 practicing members and another 15 or 1,600 people who would call themselves associate members, and the associate members frequently do pilgrimages to Iona. 
You talk to almost anyone in Scotland and you say the word Iona and even if they're not part of the church, they talk about the fact that this is a place of peace. And I can remember walking onto the island and going to a restaurant right away and I said to Linda, I sat there and I went, peace that still exists, a, a place, a presence that's been, a place that's been set aside for his honor and glory by a saint and many saints that have followed him, a footprint left on a three mile by one mile island that most people would say, so what? But from what we know, all of northern Scotland, all of Scotland and much of northern and central England was evangelized as a result of the monasteries that were started by St. Columba. And let me tell you, evangelizing northern Scotland had to be one of the toughest things in the whole wide world because the Picts were there. P-I-C-T-S, short for picture people. They were called picture people because their bodies were totally tattooed with blue hues. Have you seen Braveheart? That's many years past, but that, that blue that you see in Braveheart really can be traced back to the Picts. Only it was permanent tattoo, it wasn't paint. And when the Romans came to try to conquer them, they came out to battle nude. <laughs> Rather intimidating. Because they believed that the tattoos on their body had some kind of spiritual significance and that would impact the enemy. And St. Columba made up his mind that he was going to evangelize the Picts. As a matter of fact, there's a story told that he went to the gates of the city where the Pict king lived and they locked the gates on him. And he did the form of the cross and the gates opened that it wasn't long after that that the Pict king came to Christ. There are also many stories about the fact that he did battle with the Loch Ness Monster. Because he had the amazing ability to see into the spiritual world and the battle that was going on there. Could see angels, could see demons. One day saw six demons lined up to take over the island of Iona and he fasted and prayed against them for 24 hours. And they went away. And history says that there's another place on the mainland where there was a lot of trouble the next night. And I share all that because in our rational West, and when we think about the kingdom and the power of the kingdom, we kind of go, oh yeah. But I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I know that the I've gotten glimpses, right? And that's as much a reality as this is a reality. <laughs> and we need to be aware of that if we're going to leave a footprint in bringing the kingdom here. The battle is going on there also. And St. Columba understood that. And didn't shy from it. This is the abbey that's been rebuilt by the Iona community as you're coming in on the ferry boat. There's a small chapel there that is um, not as big as any of our offices and purportedly it's built over the place where his first cell was. Where he would have had his abode. And, and the camera there is getting almost the width of the, the little chapel. This is the pillow of the saint. 
he used a rock as a pillow. Now we don't know for sure whether that's the pillow, but they have one there that purportedly was a pillow that he slept on. Uh, his um, followers lived a very regimented life. They didn't get eight hours of sleep any night. They were awakened at 12, 3, and 6. The monasteries were some of the busiest institutions in Celtic society, constantly teeming with people. It's not like what we often think of monastery today. This was life. They were fulfilling the roles of school, library, hospital, guest house, art center, mission statement. And the thing that I most want to emphasize to you today, if you don't get anything else out of what I say to you, is my sense is that this community had a rhythm of life. And that rhythm of life was they didn't avoid the world. They were out in the world all the time. But at the same time, they knew when it was time to come back and meditate and go into the mountains and pray. And I thought, John, as you talked this morning about the, the vertical and horizontal of the cross, the Iona community exemplifies this par excellence. They understood what it meant to, to be in both community and personal meditation and worship. Every day now at 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock at night, there is a service that happens in the chapel of the abbey there. We attended. Great music. Great acoustics. And a sense of peace. And, and I can remember Linda commenting to me when we came through Dulles Airport coming back to the United States. She said, I can tell we're back in the States. People running and shoving and trying to get to the front of the line Exactly polar opposite to what we experienced on Iona, and for that matter, in Scotland. A rhythm of life that's both coming and going. Coming to the Father and going into the world. And my sense is the devil doesn't care which of those extremes he gets us off on as long as he can distract us onto one or the other. And what do I mean by that? Here in this country and in the church, my fear is, is that we are running, 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 going, 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 and there's a form of godliness, but we lack any power to be able to do the cross in front of the gates that they would fly open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or we meditate on our own belly buttons. And that can be a deep concern in the academic community. It's kind of neat to get together and discuss theology, isn't it? Right? Yep. <laughs> but we can't stay there. We've got to answer the question, so what? And we're working hard here. Very, very hard to say it's not about just this. It's not about just this, these. It's also about this. And we can't make disciples if we're not becoming disciples. And if we don't get this rhythm of life, you know, 
will burn out, rust out, moral failure out, whatever out. It's still out. Right? I, I, Linda and I in this very room work with 25, 35 university kids, which is wonderful. <laughs> they, they, there's life. We went to a wedding. Two, two of the kids got married this last weekend down close to Hocking Hills. And uh, a rehearsal dinner, they, they had assigned seats. And they s assigned seats for us. Well, let me tell you a story. We were talking. We were in a pub one night eating. And a little old lady that ran the pub was talking about the fact she was coming to the United States. Linda asked her in the, the Northwest. She said, are you going to go to Yellowstone? She said, yeah, I'm going to go to Yellowstone. But I've been there before. And when you've seen one geezer, you've seen them all. <laughs> Oh, we, we had the privilege of sitting assigned seats with the geezers. <laughs> and I remember looking in the mirror, and the reason we got assigned to the table with the geezers because we were geezers. <laughs> but you know where I wanted to be? Some of our kids were there. And there was life and vibrancy. And I, I wanted to be there. My heart wanted to be there. But my body said, you got to be there. <laughs> A rhythm of life. And I said to these kids, they were over to the house last night. We probably had 35, 40 last night. To, to hang out for a picnic. And some of them rode back with us from down there and talking last night. They said, you guys invest in us all kinds of time. How do you do it? And I, th I thought about it for a while. And I said, well, one of the things I don't do is I don't participate in a lot of church programming at my local church. be perfectly honest, I don't participate in any. <laughs> I'm not saying we go to worship, yeah. Okay, Linda's trying to get me off the hook here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm to the place in life that I don't have time to just play the status quo. I don't want to manage all that stuff when there are wonderful opportunities in the world to be out there making an impact for the kingdom. And I don't want you as members of this community to just manage the programming of whatever ministry you're there unless you are convinced that it's stuff that God wants you to be doing. Activity for the sake of activity is not kingdom work. And John, I want to affirm the attitude that you've brought to this campus in continually retreating with people. Because it's a rhythm of life like I'm trying to share with you that occurs in the Iona community. What time is it? I got lots of time. Questions? Reactions? Oh, I like that. <laughs> I'll keep preaching. <laughs> How do we do a rhythm of life in a busy culture um, in which it's so easy to get caught up in logistically? How do you do a rhythm? I don't do it well all the time, Gwen. I'm not putting myself up as the... Linda will tell you I don't do it very well. I think Sabbath, I th John's convinced me that Sabbath is very important. Uh, I can remember in this room when he spoke to trustees and told trustees that Sabbath was created before the fall. <laughs> and that meddled with my mind for a long time, just messed with me. If God thought it was necessary before the fall and sin, or, sin entered in, how much more necessary is it post-fall? And, and so I would encourage, I think we need to take Sabbath. Now, I'm not legalistic in saying what that has to look like, that your Sabbath has to look like my Sabbath, but you do know what your Sabbath should look like. Okay? 
I tell the kids in here all the time, there are some things in the Word of God that I don't understand. I have a hard time comprehending, right? But there are some things that I do understand, and when it comes to many of the things in my Christian life, I do know what God wants. I don't know about you, it's not a matter of my knowing what He wants. It's not a matter of hearing His voice. It's a matter of obeying His voice. They're two different things. And I don't know about you, but I found God to be a non-negotiator. <laughs> Correct? Yeah. Back in January, he, he, this is a, just a stupid little thing. But he, just a couple of words he said to me, that's enough coffee. Quit it. That was not a negotiating point. And I could have said, well, it's something I ate, or... But I knew better. I knew it was the voice of God speaking to me through the power of His Holy Spirit. That's a time to what? Obey. So I haven't been drinking coffee, and the smell of coffee is a very alluring thing in my life. Obedience. But to define that rhythm, early morning. I did Norm Shavchuk's devotional guides for years and still pull them out at different times. And his philosophy was an hour a day, a day a month, a week a year. What he means by that, get away an hour a day, get away a day a month, get away a week a year just to hang out with God. Or as my wife will tell you, and she hassles me and I know she's hassled others, waste time with God. Because type A that I am, that's what it feels like in the beginning, isn't it? Yeah. Are you listening? <laughs> oh. oh, that was low, but appropriate. <laughs> and the members of my president's council will tell you that I encourage them to go away a day a month on the seminary. Not a vacation day. Make it a part of the rhythm of your life. I encourage them. Some of them do it. I don't always get it done. But I know when I need it. And I need it now. I can tell you that. Coming back from Scotland and it's 10 o'clock now. Um, I just need to get away. And I will. Because quite frankly, my impact on the kingdom is just motion. So great question, Gwen. Columbus changed the world as a politician. I've talked to you about that as a prophet, as a miracle worker, as a faith healer, as a charismatic Christian. As a matter of fact, Bradley says he would have been known to have all of the gifts of the Spirit except speaking in tongues. So when I say charismatic Christian, he was a gifted Christian. And you say, really? Working miracles? Yeah. But when you're hanging out with the God, reciting 150 Psalms and getting close to Him, who knows what kind of power? And others caught it. The Iona community is still there. He did this through prayer. I've talked to you about the Psalms poetry. I, I, we did artwork back there a little bit. Do you realize that the Book of Kells was written on and illustrated on Iona? And it got back to Ireland because the Norse were coming in and raiding monasteries all the time. And so to protect the Book of Kells, they moved it to inland Ireland, not anywhere along the coast. So the artistic beauty, the, the sense of participating in, in kingdom beauty. If you've, any of you have seen pages from that book, uh, all four Gospels illustrated. Absolutely beautiful. 
great patience to wait. It's another one of the places I need work. You see, I have an agenda for the kingdom. But Lyndon has been encouraging me, and I just read a book by, um, just like that, I lost his name, huh? David Benner, who says the kingdom of God is all about overcoming the kingdom of self. And part of the self in me is, is that I have an agenda for the kingdom that's not always his agenda. And my agenda always involves numbers. Nickels and noses. And yet I read the Gospels and the life of Christ and his life was nothing about nickels and noses. As a matter of fact, there were a lot fewer noses at the end than there were at the beginning. And nickels. <laughs> praise. There's a paragraph I want to read you from Bradley's book on the praise issue. Maybe Columba has another message for modern theologians in the form of a gentle reminder. His own study was rooted in a life of prayer and devotion and not carried on in the detached atmosphere, academic atmosphere of a university department of divinity. His theology sprang naturally out of his attitude of praise in which the mystery of God was approached with an almost childlike sense of wonder and intense respect as well as with a delight in the marvels of creation. Isn't that amazing? His theology flowed out of a life of praise and worship. We badly, and I quote, need to recover the Columban sense of praise in all its fullness and riches. We have stripped wonder out of most of our experiences, including in much modern worship out of our encounter with God. A culture where everything is upfront and instantly accessible as well as instantly available leaves little room for mystery or holiness. And then there's the sense of presence. Bradley makes a great deal of this with St. Columba. That he would have probably been offended in even being called a missionary. He didn't consider himself a missionary. He considered himself an incarnational presence of the Almighty God. And Bradley talks about that a lot, actually quoting an Anglican priest, a lady priest from East London, who has recently argued very persuasively against this whole mission-oriented approach in favor of one which is based on the principle of presence. Rather than thinking in terms of missionaries and so creating a false distinction between Christians and others, she prefers the notion of witness. And witness was very important in the, the Ionan community. In this sense, they not only believed in martyrs, they called them red martyrs, people dying literally for the faith, they also believed in white martyrs. And white martyrs are people who die to self daily for the sense of the coming of the kingdom. Rather than thinking in terms of missionary and creating a false distinction between Christians and others, she prefers the notion of witness. Witnesses are not people who are radically different from those to whom they witness. Our witnessing can take a wide range of authentic forms depending on our circumstances, talents, and abilities. It ranges from constant and steady witness of the faithful presence 
the people ready to suffer and rejoice with their neighbors, the church that's still open for prayer and praise, to the dynamism of radical social action. We can be mute witnesses in the holiness of our lives and vocal witnesses telling others the story of Christ. Preach Christ and when necessary use words. And then there was a the whole issue of protection. To St. Columbus it was very important to prey on the whole uh, notion of protection of the whole armor of God on people because he was aware of the spiritual battle. I've got to move on. Forgiveness, penitence, pilgrimage, leadership. Um, let me just do the leadership thing and then we've got to give them a couple minutes for small group. Right, Jim? You, remember, you took some of my time, so I'm taking some back. <laughs> The issue of lead, I'm quoting from Bradley again, the issue of leadership is an extraordinarily confusing one in, contempor in the contemporary church. Authority in the Columban church was personal rather than institutional. Bradley highlights both the danger of unfettered charismatic leadership that is exploitative and manipulative when unchecked, but also that we have left little room for leadership in the quest for accountability, decentralization, corporate management, and democratic participation. I just told someone today, you read the Word of God, and God is very seldom found in the majority. Correct? And... I fear in the church sometimes today he's also not in the minority who's just griping all the time about something that's going on. Especially if it involves change in worship. Like Jesus, Columbus spoke as one having authority and had a manifest integrity and humility which made people trust him. As we journey on today, could he be urging us to find new leaders and follow them as they follow the one who is Lord and Master of all? Let's close with a concluding poem and a paragraph from N.T. Wright. A poem about Columba. From Aaron's shores, Columba came to preach and teach and heal and found a church which showed the world how God on earth was real. In greening grass and reckless wave and cloud and ripening corn the Celtic Christians traced the course of grace through nature born. In hosting strangers healing pains and tireless works of peace they served the servant, Christ the Lord, and found their faith increase. In simple prayer and alien land as summoned by the Son, S-O-N, they celebrated how God's call made work and worship one. God grant that what Columbus sowed may harvest yet more seed as we engage both flesh and faith to marry work and deed. And then N.T. Wright, and I quote from page 253. Christian holiness consists not of trying as hard as we can to be good, but of learning to live the new world created by Easter, the new world we publicly entered in our baptism. There are many parts of the world we can't do anything about except pray. But here is one part of the world. One part of the physical reality that we can do something about. And that is the creature each of us calls myself. Personal holiness and global holiness belong together. 
those who wake up to the one may well find themselves called to wake up to the other as well. Wake up, church. The kingdom of God is at hand. Amen.